I am so pleased to have Alex with us today. Alex Hansel is the lead assessment scientist for Georgia's Bank Yellowtail Flounder and Georgia's Bank Winter Flounder. His research interests include species distribution models, incorporating environmental effects into stock assessments and model validation. And he is with us today to talk about this very important and timely topic. So with that, I will hand over the mic to Alex. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Kristen, uh, and thank you, Lisa. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you both for inviting me to give this seminar. So I'm a relatively new um, stock assessment biologist at the center, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the work that I've done in my first year or been a part of. And like most good science, this is a true collaborative effort. Um, so even though I'm presenting it, there's a lot of people here that have contributed to this work. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the co-authors listed on this front slide. Uh, so Steve, Amanda, Jamie, and Larry, and then a special shout out to Lisa Kerr, who's a professor at the University of Maine. And a lot of um, this work that I'm gonna present here today is kind of her brainchild. So um, an overview about what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So I'm going to introduce the Northeast uh, US region. I'm going to talk about the stock assessment process that's conducted at the center. Then I'm going to introduce this framework that was developed and again, kind of spearheaded by Lisa Kerr, um, creating this framework to uh, explore environmental covariates within our stock assessment process. I'm gonna show you a case study of how that framework was applied to a recent research track assessment in American Place. And then I'm gonna talk about some lessons learned and next steps where we uh, plan to use this framework forward looking at some, several other species in the region. So a little bit of background, again, just so we're all on the same page. I'm sure many of you are familiar, but the map on the left here is the Northeast US with some of the important areas here highlighted. So in this region, whoop, this region, there's a long history of fishing and it's uh, important to a lot of the communities here, both historically um, and monetarily. So the plot on the bottom right here shows the catch history for um, Georgia's Bank Yellowtail Flounder, um, which is located off here on the left uh, plot. But you can see there's a long time series of um, catch here and there were fisheries operating even before the 1930s in this region. So fishing is really important in this region. And then also more recently, there's been a lot of studies um, and work done looking at changing ocean conditions uh, in the region. Uh, so specifically, there's been a lot of literature showing that the Gulf of uh, Maine is one of the fastest warming regions in the world. And here on the top of the plot, you can see um, some temperature anomaly plots for Georgia's Bank and the Gulf of Maine, both showing this increasing trend. So along with these studies, there's also been a lot of studies looking at you know, species distributions and changing uh, stock dynamics due to changing ocean conditions. So the takeaway here is this region's important fisheries and the ocean uh, appears to be changing. So um, just to kind of talk about uh, the environment and stock assessments. So there's this big push, um, you know, to try to consider environmental drivers within our stock assessment. It's highlighted um, a lot uh, in this document over here on the right, the next generation of stock assessment from 2018. Um, so there's this big push to do it. However, uh, in our region, uh, the majority of assess assessments still do not directly account for environmental uh, covariates uh, within the assessment. Um, and one of the issues we have in our region is we have a lot of uh, assessment models with retrospective patterns. So an example of that is this plot here to the left um, showing spawning stock biomass uh, for Georgia's bank winter flounder. Uh, and retrospective, retrospective patterns are basically when you add years of data to the model or take years away, um, some of our important time series uh, change. Um, so it's basically model misspecification and you can see this example here. So in this plot, when you start taking years away, you can see our uh, trajectory of trends here change. And this is obviously problematic for management, or can be. So there's a lot of things that can cause retrospective patterns and there's been lots of studies looking at them. One of the hypotheses is that, uh, you know, not considering environmental effects could cause uh, some of these issues. So uh, how, can the, how can the environment be incorporated within our stock assessments? So to me, I kind of think about this in two major ways. So it can either be incorporated or explored outside of the assessment model, uh, which can be done to provide useful context. You can also do modeling external of the assessment. So 
the way I think about this too, the example is like CPUE standardization. So you could fit a generalized linear model outside uh, that accounts for changes in catchability and this model could possibly be accounting for changes in temperature or depth. And then this model could be incorporated into our actual stock assessment. However, you can also directly account for environmental uh, links within our assessments, uh, especially with our newer kind of types, newer integrated assessment models, looking at uh, models like stock synthesis or the Woods Hole assessment model, WAM, which I'll talk to you about a little bit here. So an example of a time series that could be incorporated in the stock assessment is down here on the right. So this is the Summer Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation Index, or AMO, which basically shows deviations in sea surface temperature. Um, and so this time series, or a very similar one, is actually used in the Western Bluefin Tuna Stock Assessment to look at changes in catchability and fish distribution. So, you know, there's this want and need to kind of explore environmental covariates within our stock assessment. However, it's not always easy to do so. Uh, the environment can influence a lot of the different stock dynamics, or parts that are, you know, important for our models. Uh, so we basically, we need to make sure that if we're including the environment in the assessment, it needs to make, you know, it needs to be plausible and make common sense. And then also incorporating the environment uh, really needs to improve the model's uh, diagnostics. So despite there's this big one um, and kind of push to do it, it's not always easy to do so. So incorporating the environment. So at the center, um, I'm sure many of you might be familiar with this, but there's two major kind of paths for our stock assessment processes. So there's the research track and the management track. This talk is going to focus on a lot of the work that's done in the research tracks, um, which I've uh, been involved in several of these since starting at the center. So the way I think about it is the research track is you basically uh, get to start over. So everything is on the table uh, for improving the assessment. You can change assessment uh, models. You can do all exploratory analysis. The real goal here is to kind of produce the best available science. And this is typically done um, in this working group phase, which is formed, which is usually a, a collaborative process that's formed with uh, scientists at the center, at state governments, uh, NGOs, and universities. And over this one or two year period, they conduct research to kind of produce a new assessment. This thing goes to peer review. If it passes peer review, it goes into this management track where it's updated uh, every so often to inform management. So the research track is really where a lot of changes can be made. In the management track, changes can be made to the assessment, but they tend to be relatively minor. So one of the cool things that's been going on with the research tracks uh, at the center is there's been this kind of transition that's occurring, uh, at least of the ones that I've been involved with, where we're uh, transitioning away from some of our more traditional stock assessment models, such as virtual population analysis, VPA, or your uh, typical statistical catch at age model. And we've been uh, transitioning them over to a state-based model called the Woods Hole Assessment Model, which was developed by Tim Miller uh, and company at the center. And this framework here is really cool because it gives us a lot of uh, different ways that we can look at incorporating environmental variables uh, in the stock assessment process or in the model. So there's kind of two uh, general ways you could do it. So there's this random effects, uh, which could account for variability without a direct mechanistic link. So it can allow these stock dynamics to kind of vary over time. And you can see a list of the stock dynamics here. So recruitment, survival, natural mortality, uh, selectivity, and catchability. So it can allow them to vary over time. So uh, an environmental covariate is not directly in the model, but this variation could be accounting for some environmental process that's going on behind the scenes. And then the other cool thing we can do is we can actually put an environmental uh, time series directly into the assessment model to help estimate uh, certain stock dynamics, which you can see down here below. And that's what this plot over here is on the right. Uh, it's an example. So it's from a paper done by Brian Stock and Tim Miller back in 2021, where they looked at using the cold pool index, which is this plot um, up here on the top, uh, which is a measure, of, I think, a bottom water temperature. And they used this to help um, estimate recruitment within the model for Southern New England yellowtail. So uh, the general terms of reference for our research track stock assessments um, have eight terms of reference. And basically all these uh, terms of reference, uh, the goal of the working group is to kind of address and meet all these terms of reference. So the first one here is the one I'm really going to focus on today, which is identifying relevant ecosystem and climate influences on stock dynamics and considering findings as appropriate in addressing other terms of reference. 
So this term of reference is really important because the goal here is to kind of develop this ecosystem context and then see how we can use it um, to help with our other terms of reference within the stock assessment uh, research track process. So the other terms of reference here, um, I'm just gonna go over them briefly because they're important because we're gonna see how this kind of all interconnects as I move through the seminar. So the second term of reference here is estimating fisheries dependent uh, data, so catch data. The third term of reference will be looking at our survey data. The fourth one is where we get to do the assessment model, such as uh, playing around or developing an assessment in WAM. Uh, the fifth one is biological reference points, so looking at updating those. Six would be projections. Seven is research recommendations, because even though we have a great team working on this and we spend a year to two years, there's always more research to be done. And then the last one here would be developing a backup assessment in case the first uh, recommended assessment uh, didn't pass peer review. Um, so you can see here the term of reference one really ties into all these other terms of reference. And the goal here is to you know, look and try to have an understanding of how the ecosystem is influencing the species in the stock and how we can use this information um, to help address these terms of reference. So how do we actually do that? And how do we get things that are actually you know, tangible of things that we can actually test within the stock assessment. So this is the diagram kind of of a conceptual flow that again, Lisa Kerr was really, uh, this is kind of what she pioneered. Um, so to me, I kind of think of it as a three-step process. So the first step here is we're gonna be characterizing our state of knowledge. And this is done by doing a thorough literature review of you know, peer review publications and gray literature. And then also having uh, outreach meetings with industry, so with fishermen, uh, again, because they're obviously experts on these species because they're seeing them uh, daily on the water. And from this, we develop an ecosystem context. So we basically get a baseline understanding and we use this information to form some hypotheses about how the environment could be influencing you know, these species or stocks that we're interested in. So the next step there is then to take the information learned um, kind of in that baseline data and look at developing some relationships uh, with ocean variables um, and the data that goes into the stock assessment. And this has been done through a lot of exploratory modeling, which I'll show you some examples of here. And then if we find, and what this can do is it can help us determine um, non-stationarity in some of our um, uh, stock dynamics. And then it can also help us inform uh, parameterization from when we actually get to the stock assessment modeling step. So then finally, the last step here is doing some conducting or doing some exploring some integrated modeling. So basically, you know, we build, um, we get our hypotheses from the literature and the fishermen, we test them with the data that would go into the stock assessment. And then if we find if those relationships hold up, so they're supported by our hypotheses and the data, then we can explore including them directly within the assessment model. So within WAM, um, either the, as those random effects or, you know, as the time series that I talked about, and what this does is it's cool, is it, it, the result of this is it gives us some climate informed models that could be used um, to help produce advice, or at the very least could be used to help um, context, give us context about the species, the stock. So this is the framework that I'm gonna go over today. Um, and this is, if you were to take, I'm gonna cover a lot of ground here in this seminar, but if you could take away one thing, it's kind of uh, this framework uh, and developing it so we can actually test things within the stock assessment. So um, that's the framework. And now I'm gonna show you kind of a case study so you can see how it's applied and what came out of it. Um, so this is gonna be for the American Place Research Track, uh, which I think was a very successful research track. I'm also slightly biased because it was my first one. But it started in July of 2021 and it just concluded in July of this year. Uh, and spoiler alert, it passed peer review. So that's good news. You can see here the working group members and uh, a list of people that contributed to the working group. So in the working group, uh, Steve Cadron, who's a professor at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology was the chair. And then we also had scientists uh, from the center, the council, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada um, and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And you can see again here, Lisa was one of the working group members um, who really kind of pioneered this framework that I'm going over. And then we also had a lot of major contributors. So I think, to me, one of the reasons this uh, research track was so successful is because it was such a collaborative process um, and we got a lot of help uh, and a lot of products were produced by people that were not working group members. Um, particularly, we had a lot of help from graduate students, postdocs, um, and researchers. So a little bit of background on PLACE, just so you can kind of get some uh, understanding of how it fits in with the ecosystem context that I'm gonna share. 
So place, uh, flatfish in New England, again, have been targeted for a long time. There's fisheries since the 1800s. So place have been caught um, since the 1880s in a beam trawl fishery, or flatfish have. Um, there are some foreign fleet catches here in the 1960s and 70s. And then since the 1980s, mixed species ground fish trips are the primary method of catching them. Over here on the right, the top where the cursor is, that's uh, showing a time series of catch for a place uh, here. And you can see some of those uh, foreign fleet catches here in the 1960s and 70s in gray. So going into this research track, uh, uh, before, kind of before the research track conducted, place was being assessed with the virtual population analysis, or VPA. Uh, and this assessment did have retrospective issues, uh, basically that model misspecification that I talked about in the introduction. So this figure down here on the right shows uh, some of the history of the American place uh, stock assessments. So you can see the different model runs here corresponding to the years. And then also here, um, there are some retrospective adjustments that were made to some of these terminal years, which you can see here as the white dots. Yeah, and I really like this figure. I stole it from Steve Cadron, but I think it does a good job showing kind of the history of uh, place assessments going into the research track. So a little bit a uh, quick quick overview on ecology again, because it's going to tie into these uh, term of one uh, ecosystem climate references. So place is a cold water demersal fish. It's relatively sedentary. They make seasonal migrations um, inshore to spawn in the spring. On the right here, you can see the distribution of place catches in US and Canadian uh, surveys. So this here is really just to show the overall kind of distribution here. We're gonna be focusing on place in the US, which is a separate stock. So basically place here caught in the Gulf of Maine and on Georgia's bank. So again, this is a separate stock than, than Canada. And that's what this talk is focusing on. And then over here, you can see the size uh, for place. And then the oldest place in US waters was uh, estimated to be 24 years of age. So now that we're all experts on American Place, uh, I'm gonna talk to you uh, about kind of the working group and some of the results uh, of this framework being applied. So again, this framework, um, so I should say the working group, the way it was set up is we had a series of meetings where then we broke into subgroups um, to kind of focus on specific terms of reference. So the way the research was conducted is teams uh, broke off and wrote, wrote working papers on spe specific research topics. These working papers were then um, brought to the entire working group for review and feedback. And then eventually these working papers were incorporated into the final assessment report. Uh, report. So here you can see a list of all the working papers that I'm gonna go over um, with their numbers next to WP. So WP stands for working paper. And you can see how they fit into this kind of three uh, step uh, general approach here. So characterizing state of knowledge, determining the hypothesis, then uh, developing relationships with the data that goes into the assessments and then the integrated modeling. So again, there's a lot of work here. Um, a lot of people did a heavy lifting on here. I would really highly recommend if you have specific like nitty gritty questions or would like to learn more about any of these papers or steps, they are all publicly available and they could be found down here um, on this link. So I have the link later in the presentation too, if people are interested. You can also just Google the Northeast Fisheries Science Center's stock assessment portal and find them there. But again, I would highly recommend going to look at some of these papers. And the final assessment report is also in that portal. So i uh, going to go through some of the results here of these working papers and show again how that framework was applied to American Place. So the first thing here um, is uh, the ecosystem profile. So the goal of this was basically to do a literature review, and this was spearheaded by Jamie Behan, who is a researcher at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Uh, and she did a, an excellent job with this. So she reviewed around 90 uh, peer reviewed publications and gray literature spanning over a hundred years. And she tried to focus mostly on the US stock region. So finding, focusing on papers primarily in the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's bank. However, she also looked at papers in other regions as well. And from this, uh, she developed an ecosystem profile, which is basically trying to look at um, how the environment is related to these stock dynamics down here in the left. So looking at uh, what the current state of knowledge is for distribution and habitat use, recruitment, growth and maturity, and natural mortality. So I'm gonna go over briefly some of the things she found, which is gonna kind of set the stage for some of the exploratory analysis and our integrated modeling. 
So uh, the ecosystem profile. Uh, so the first thing is distribute and habitat, distribution and habitat. So she found that in the literature, um, there's some support here that place are uh, sensitive to climate change. And it, it supported that place have moved deeper in recent years, possibly due to, uh, or at least these deeper movements are correlated with the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation Index, the AMO, which is looking at deviations in sea surface temperature again, or the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, which is uh, deviations in uh, sea level pressure. And then uh, there's also some, so, some evidence or papers that sound like uh, as habitat is projected um, to decrease moving forward in response to changing ocean conditions. So the plot over here on the right shows some of these results. I should say, so one of the one of the, the cool things about, or one of the good things here in the region is we have these uh, trawl surveys that have been running continuously since the 1960s, one in the spring and one in the fall. So you're gonna see me refer to a lot of data and plots from these trawl surveys because they um, are kind of these great time series we can use to do a lot of um, some of this exploratory analysis. So that's um, what these plots are based off here. But on the top here, you can see the spring. These two plots up here are the spring, the bottom two are the fall. So the plot here on the left column shows a uh, habitat distribution from 2002 to 2014 with higher probability of habitat being red and lower being blue. So from this here, you can see the place habitat appears to be primarily uh, in the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank. And then you can also see uh, these are projections done 60 to 80 years in the future uh, here on the right, showing how habitat might increase or decrease under changing ocean conditions uh, with increases looking like in the spring on Georgia's bank and then maybe some decreases in coastal waters here uh, in the fall. Jamie also looked at recruitment, again, an important stock dynamic and found that there's evidence that the temperature and the North Atlantic Oscillation Index um, might be influencing recruitment of this fish, um, specifically suggesting that maybe higher recruitment at lower water temperatures. So that's what this plot over here shows on the right. So it's from that Brodziak and O'Brien paper. On the y-axis, I think you have recruits per spawner anomalies. Um, and then on the x here is bottom water temperature, but you can see here there's higher uh, uh, recruitment at these colder temperatures. And then she also found some evidence in the literature suggesting non-stationarity um, in recruitment over time. Uh, touching on the other ones really quickly, so growth and maturity and natural mortality. Uh, I think unsurprisingly, she found that there's um, some evidence that they could be linked to water temperature. And specifically, as water temperature increases, um, this fish might experience accelerated growth, reductions in size, earlier maturity, um, also possibly higher rates of natural mortality, especially on younger fish. I think these are from these Levangi paper down here from 2021. And then this plot over here is from a Zhang paper in 2020, looking at uh, age and maturity in female place off of Canada, uh, looking at spatial temporal changes. So that kind of sums up um, some high level takeaways from the literature review uh, that Jamie conducted, kind of helping us form some initial hypotheses. And the next step here was uh, to meet with industry and fishermen, again, because they're experts seeing these fish out in the water. So I think this is one of the great things about um, all of the research tracks that I've been involved in is there's always this uh, in industry engagement portion, which has been really informative and I think really helpful for the term of reference one work. So for PLACE, this was done through a series of meetings um, and conversations. So there were two in-person meetings set up, one in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and then one in Portland, Maine. Um, and then Tyler Pavlovich also, who was a working group member, um, had individual meetings with fishermen as well to discuss some of these topics kind of in more fine scale. And one of the cool things he did during the industry stakeholder meetings is he also had this shiny app where he showed distributions of commercial catch and survey catch uh, to kind of stimulate conversation and discussion, which I think was really helpful and informative. So you can see down here some of the general um, discussions that were had uh, about fishery management um, and then specifically for the ecosystem context, looking at distribution changes and some of our catch rates. So some of the takeaways from these uh, kind of uh, conversations uh, with fishermen and then also the meetings. So some, some general themes I think should emerge here, but basically uh, we kind of, from the meetings, we kind of heard that there's a lot of thought that place aren't coming in shore anymore. Um, they, fishermen tended to think that abundance, size and age have been influenced by water temperature in recent years. 
uh, fishermen constantly uh, mentioned kind of the theme that they're worried about uh, catchability in the surveys with possibly, you know, seeing fish moving deeper uh, and changes in that. And then some of the themes that came through in Tyler's interviews or discussions, more one-on-one -on -one discussions with fishermen were looking at, uh, there's kind of this the theme that place distribution tends to be linked to depth. Uh, fish used to come inshore earlier than they are now. So they used to come inshore around March and April, but now they're not coming inshore until May or June. Um, some comments about fish being found in deeper waters and then the uh, fish concentrations are associated with depth. So the, the takeaway for me here, um, I think, and uh, here is that this kind of this general theme of depth, so changes in depth uh, is what fishermen were observing, and a lot of the time they think that these changes in depth could be related to changes in water temperature. So um, that literature review and then the industry outreach really kind of helped the, complete that first step in this general approach. So characterizing the knowledge, giving us that baseline data to help us form some hypotheses uh, moving forward. So I think the takeaway here is that place are probably uh, sensitive to changing ocean conditions um, and changes in the ocean are probably influencing their stock dynamics, which I do not think is overly surprising. Um, and then the general takeaway here for the specific stock dynamics is it looks like there's evidence that they're kind of related to water temperature. So recruitment, growth, uh, and mortality, and then that fish might be moving deeper, possibly due to changes in water temperature. So the next step um, in this kind of three-tiered approach now, uh, again, so the goal here was to take that information from the literature and the fishermen and then do some exploratory modeling now to look uh, at relationships in our data and see kind of if they supported those hypotheses. Um, and again, here we're gonna be using uh, mostly the data from those two surveys I told you about. So the bottom trawl survey from the Science Center in the spring and the fall. And I apologize for the acronyms, but our field loves acronyms. Um, the NEFSC here just stands for the Northeast Fishery Science Center and BTS is the bottom trawl survey. Um, but you can see some of the data we had to look at some of these uh, relationships here. And again, these are all from uh, the surveys and then some of the environmental data we looked at as well for relationships. So uh, the first thing, again, looking at recruitment. So just like the literature review, Jamie Behan led a lot of this work. And I know she's in the process of turning this into a manuscript. Um, but so what she did is she took a lot of these stock dynamics um, and she ended up uh, fitting generalized additive models to them to explore, to basically see if any of these environmental time series were accounting for any of the kind of deviance um, in these stock dynamics. So just in case you're not familiar, uh, generalized additive models or GAMs are basically models that allow us to look at relationships and they allow for nonlinear trends. So here for recruitment, you can see on the y-axis here, we have recruits as a function of spawning stock biomass. Uh, for the spring and the fall. Again, there's the spring and the fall time series because of the two surveys uh, across the time period. So here, the, this is the, the raw data, I believe, which kind of shows this increasing trend. And then on the right, uh, you can see what some of the GAMs that she fit to the data. Um, and so basically the way you read these plots is any value above zero is above average and any value below zero is below average. So here she found the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation Index or the AMO had a significant relationship uh, with uh, recruitment both in the spring and the fall. And you can see here, it's interesting that we're getting these larger values at warmer water temperatures, which is kind of in contrast to some of the literature that we found in the first step. Growth, so she also did the same thing here, but now looking at um, weighted age which is pretty cool. So here you can see the fall weighted age from the surveys for the fish on the left. So the top plot here is ages one to five, and then the bottom plot here is ages six to 11 plus, which are the ages that go into the assessment. On the bottom left-hand plot here, you can see this kind of this trend of changes in weighted age, uh, possibly decreasing over time. So again, she fit a series of generalized additive models to each age, weighted age, group here and uh, this table here basically shows what's significant. So she looked at these different covariates uh, in response to weighted age of so the GSI Gulf Stream Index, Atlantic Multi Decadal Oscillation Index, spawning stock biomass and bottom temperature. And what she found here, so basically any square here that's shaded in uh, indicated a significant relationship. So from here you can see that it looks like the AMO in the fall and the spring kind of had 
um, these significant relationships with weighted age. And then you can see some of these response plots down here as well, showing that you know at these warmer water temperatures, uh, uh, weighted age might be slightly less. So she also did something something she also did something similar <laughs> for looking at distribution. Um, but I just due to time, I'm going to switch over to talk about some of the other exploratory modeling uh, relationships we did. So this here uh, is looking at distribution and catchability. Uh, so the group decided to develop a VAST model, which is basically a spatial, temporal, uh, generalized linear uh, mixed model. And these models are pretty cool because they allow us to look at uh, changes in distribution or they're, they're effective at estimating changes in distribution. They can also be used to standardize indices of abundance for these changes as well as composition data. So it's kind of this cool tool to look at uh, distribution changes outside of the assessment model and environmental covariates. Um, and it also gives us an avenue to do this analysis outside the assessment and then bring it into the assessment. We also did um, looked at doing some counterfactual analysis, uh, which was a paper done by Charles Preddy and Jim Thorson, where basically you can turn the random effects on and off and vast and kind of estimate potentially what environmental covariates are driving any observed changes in uh, center of gravity, which is cool. So the plots over here on the right uh, show some of the survey data that these uh, vast models were fit to. So the blue here is from the Northeast Fishery Science Center. Uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center. <laughs> the red is from the state of Massachusetts, and the green is from Maine, uh, New Hampshire. And again, there's two separate models to fit here again because we have the fall and the spring survey. And then down here, I should say each one of those dots represents the tow location of the survey over the entire time series. And then here you can see the distribution for some of the tow by tow uh, covariates, so temperature and depth. So just briefly to show some of the results of this exploratory work. Um, so one of the cool things about VAST is it ex uh, uh, estimates effective area occupied, or basically how much area the fish is using. So that's what these plots over here on the left are showing. So for the fall, which is this red one, and the spring, which is this blue one, this downward trend basically shows that uh, over time, place appear to be using slightly less area. The plots down here at the bottom are, again, output from VAST showing uh, changes in center of gravity. So the left one is eastings and the right one is northings. So the eastings basically shows directional change east to west. So lower values here would be further east, higher values would be further west. On this plot, it's similar, but lower values are further south and higher values are further north. So you can see here there have been some changes um, in center of gravity over time. And then the, the different colors relate to different model runs, kind of doing that counterfactual analysis I mentioned with the random effects. And the cool thing here is we found that it looks like these changes in center of gravity um, are most correlated with depth, which is pretty interesting. And then on the right here, um, this is some of the indices that were produced uh, by VAST and then comparing them to our design-based or tr our traditional uh, surveys. So again, on the left is the fall, the right is the spring. The top is a com combined index, so using the states and the science center to produce a single index. Um, and then you can see the individual indices uh, below. There's a Albatross and Bigelow. So at the center, there was a change in vessel in 2009. So these are both the Science Center, but they're modeled differently here because a new vessel was used. But the cool thing here is, so this the outputs here, which are the indices, basically give us another thing to test in the assessment to account for these distribution changes. So another, uh, getting to the end here of the exploratory modeling, but another cool thing that was done um, is that the group uh, led by Keith Hankowski, who is a, a graduate student at the University of Massachusetts School for Marine Science and Technology, and the team there did some fisheries dependent standardization using generalized uh, models. And the cool thing they did here is the, um, they took a lot of the feedback they got from the industry stakeholder meetings and they explored using them in the standardization models. So obviously one of those trends that came up or themes uh, that came up pretty uh, religiously was that depth might be influencing uh, catchability. Uh, so they ended up exploring this within the standardization models and the model diagnostics and model selections actually supported including depth in the final standardization model, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so down here on the bottom left, you can see a distribution of, uh, of fishing locations, but then here on the right, um, you can see our year effect estimates are basically our abundance time series. So this is a diagnostic plot. Um, this methodology was taken from a Bentley paper that was published back in 2012. 
um, but it, it shows the abundance uh, time series. But the plot to really look at here is this one that's highlighted in red. And so these, these, these different panels are showing the effect of what happens when you add different covariates to your standardization method. So this plot here, the darker blue is the model without depth, and then this light blue here is the model with depth. So you can see uh, incorporating depth into the standardization change did minor changes to some of our yearly estimates, but overall the trend uh, held up. So that was a lot of information, which I know, uh, but hopefully uh, you can kind of see where we're going here. So this table here basically is a high level summary of everything I just powered through. So we have our stock dynamics that I just covered over here on the left. Uh, we have kind of the takeaways from our characterizing knowledge, again, which was doing the literature review and talking with fishermen, and then kind of what held up here through developing some of those relationships with the data we have and exploring some of the things we learned um, from the characterizing knowledge step. So I think here, I'm not going to read through all of them, but I, to me, the, the takeaway here is that for a lot of these, I think unsurprisingly, the theme of either temperature indices, so bottom temperature, the AMO kind of came uh, were flushed out on both of these steps. And then also depth uh, was mentioned a lot for distribution and catchability. Um, but this basically sets the stage now for doing some exploratory runs uh, in our integrated modeling step. So on to this last step in the pillar, again, the integrated modeling. So really the goal here is to look at if inclusion of time varying processes or links to the environment can improve uh, assessment model performance, and in this case, specifically for our American place. So again, we're gonna be using, uh, I'll be showing you, talking about the Woods Hole Assessment Model, or WAM, which is that state-space approach, which gives us a lot of flexibility in how we explore this, which is pretty cool. Um, and I should say that Amanda Hart, who is a postdoc at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, did a lot of this work. So she did the majority, a lot of the heavy lifting here. I think she did over 60 different model runs. Um, and they're all really well documented in her working paper, which I would highly advise that you go take a look at if you're interested. So the links that we looked at, we looked at direct environmental links, so including direct environmental time series on recruitment and catchability. And then down here, you can see the covariates that were explored. So bottom temperature, uh, sea surface temperature, North Atlantic Oscillation Index, and the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation Index. So besides these direct links, we also did runs looking at including the fishery dependent time series which again was standardizing for depth. And then we also looked at uh, incorporating, doing a run incorporating that vast time series, which was incorporating uh, distribution changes and changes in depth. And this plot over here on the right is one of the outputs of WAM, uh, kind of looking at uh, model estimates for observed values. And in this case, showing that for the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. So, uh, Due to time, I'm going to give you a very high level overview, again, of all this work that Amanda did that took multiple, multiple months. And it, I feel like I'm doing it slight injustice by doing it in two or three slides. Um, but some of the major takeaways that she found. So for the environmental runs in general, the, the kind of theme here was when you directly included an environmental link on recruitment, the models ended, uh, tended to uh, estimate decreased recruitment at higher temperatures. Uh, which is interesting because it kind of disagreed with some of that exploratory uh, modeling work that we did. Um, so I think something needs to be teased apart there a little bit further of what's going on. Um, looking at catchability, so these are catchability for the surveys, which are going to be used in the assessment. So in, in general, including those temperature time series on the catchability, the model tended to produce estimates of decreased catchability at colder temperatures, which kind of supports that hypothesis that catchability might be decreasing as fish are moving deeper. Uh, the diagnostic plots, so the way we did these model runs is we looked at, you know, uh, AIC was used, residuals, prediction skill. Um, Amanda was really thorough and did a really good job kind of documenting the different steps on how to evaluate these different models. And then they were bought the, kind of all discussed in the working group. Um, but the diagnostics basically did not support using the fisheries dependent time series or the VAST index um, as candidate model runs. And you can see example here of some of the diagnostics on the plot on the right. I think this is one of the diagnostics uh, plots for one of the models that was fit to VAST. So uh, ultimately we didn't include a direct environmental link on the models that we recommended uh, in the peer review process and for the use and management. However, I still think the integrated modeling was a major uh, success and uh, you know hugely successful. So the reason I think this is 
um, we were able to transition out of a virtual population analysis or VPA and get the model over into WAM, so into this more modern state space framework that allows for way more flexibility. Um, even though the models did not directly incorporate an environmental time series, it did incorporate uh, the recommended models incorporated random effects uh, for the numbers at age, which basically uh, the model is allowing uh, survivability, survivability to change between years and, and for each age class. So this could be accounting for some hidden environmental process that could be going on behind the scenes that we're not directly uh, measuring. And then also what this does is even though the environmental runs weren't uh, recommended to go forward, they still set valuable precedent for future management runs. So they provide context, but then they also, um, you know, in future peer reviews, if uh, the review team suggests looking at uh, water temperature again on catchability or recruitment or something like that, there's these runs that could be got, kind of looked back at, looked back at and then uh, rerun or updated. Um, and also, this also gives flexibility to the lead analyst, uh, Larry. So like moving forward in management tracks, he could look at updating these runs. And I know there's actually been some more money that's been put in to do some more work at testing environmental runs um, uh, for place moving forward. And the plot over here on the right uh, shows the, some of the candidate models that were recommended by the working group and their time series. So fishing mortality, recruitment, uh, spawning stock biomass, and then the associated uh, CVs with these runs. So uh, to kind of wrap this up with the integrated modeling step is we also looked at um, obviously biological reference points and projections. Uh, so one of the things here is do the conclusions, you know, from all of the our previous work support using different recruitment stanzas uh, for these terms of reference or these objectives. And I think this plot over here on the right, um, which is for Southern New England Winter Funder, kind of does a good job of describing why that's important. And I stole it from Tony Wood's presentation. But here on the y-axis, you can see age one recruits. And on the x-axis, you can see year. And then you can see here the different time series um, that were taken here. So if you, uh, the blue would be the entire time series of recruitment. Uh, red would be 20 years. Uh, purple would be 10 years. And you can see up here how that would influence uh, MSY estimates. And then the plots down here on the left are showing place uh, recruitment and spawning stock biomass. Um, so age one recruits here. Uh, on the Y, which are these bars here, and then SSB is here um, as this blue line. Uh, and then here you can see the relationship uh, between log H1 recruits and logs uh, SSB. So ultimately the group ended up using the full time series of recruitment uh, for reference points, but this is something that probably should be looked at going in the, uh, forward in the future. So again, I know that was a lot of information I threw at you. So some summary of findings here, uh, again, so, over the framework, it had these three major steps. So the first one is characterizing knowledge. So through the literature review and working with fishermen, uh, there's probably evidence here that place are susceptible or being influenced by changing ocean conditions. And these themes of kind of water temperature and depth came up. We developed some relationships, looking at some of the data that goes into the assessment um, with these environmental uh, variables. Uh, and again, we found kind of these, find, you know, similar trends that were supported um, to the hypotheses uh, developed um, during the literature review and talking with fishermen. There was that difference in temperature though, which probably needs to be explored a little bit going for, uh, further going forward. And then for the integrated modeling, so ultimately we didn't have any direct environmental links uh, in the recommended models. However, we did allow for random effects at numbers of age, which again could be accounting for some environmental process behind the scenes. And then again, these environmental runs do set a precedent for management tracks, so they could be updated going forward if the peer review or the lead analyst um, wanted to do so. So if these relationships change or possibly strengthen um, moving forward. So uh, the, the wrap up the uh, American Place uh, Research Track Stock Assessment. So again, the last term of reference there was to do those research recommendations. Um, so in 2020, again, this uh, research track passed peer review and the peer review panel thought all of the terms of reference were uh, successfully addressed. Um, so the working group recommendations coming out of all this work that I just showed you is really to continue to look at some of these distribution shifts, especially with the linkage to depth moving forward in time. And then also more work um, can be done on looking at recruitment and ocean temperatures as we move forward. The peer review panel had several research recommendations as well. Um, and I know they 
they were a big um, fan or kind of supported um, all the term of reference one work that we did, um, which was pretty cool. But so some of the research recommendations are to continue doing that integrated modeling, looking at the environment directly within the assessment, all that hard work uh, that was led by Amanda. They also liked the fishery dependent time series and the standardization work that was done and uh, recommend exploring uh, water temperature moving forward in that standardization as well as depth. Uh, back to the, the biological reference points and projections, again, they, they thought it's important to continue to look at this in the future, especially if recruitment is possibly influenced by a uh, environmental variable. And then also they supported looking at VAST further um, and to continue to look at that for inclusion in the assessment particularly combining the state and offshore surveys. So uh, next steps. So hopefully what I, if I know I covered a lot of information here, but I hope the takeaway from the seminar here is kind of this framework that's up on the right. So kind of this methodology of looking at ecosystem, uh, ecosystem and being ecosystem and stock dynamics and being able to form hypotheses and explore, including them uh, within the stock assessment process. So moving forward, we have research tracks. So there's one going on right now for COD, which is currently being chaired by Lisa Kerr, again, who developed, kind of developed or spearheaded this framework. Um, so this work, this framework's being applied for the COD research track. Um, and Scott Large of the Ecosystem Dynamics and Assessment Branch is kind of leading that subgroup. And they're also doing some ecosystem profile stuff, which I think is gonna be really cool. And should get some cool stuff to look uh, at the COD assessment um, when we get to that stage. So we're about a year into that currently. The, the state-space research track is also going on at the center, uh, which is chaired by Tim Miller, again, who uh, developed WAM. And we're doing, they're doing some simulation testing with environmental effects within WAM. So you know, looking at its ability to recover environmental effects. So I think there's gonna be some cool stuff that's gonna come out of that research track that could kind of help with this integrated modeling or climate-informed modeling moving forward, which will be really cool. And then finally, um, uh, so I'm a, a collaborator with Lisa Kerr and Steve Cadron on a SINAR grant, which is a cooperative institute for North Atlantic region grant uh, to get some money to uh, get some graduate students involved and to also continue applying this framework to other upcoming research track stock assessments. So Yellowtail Flounder, uh, which just started, and Steve Cadron is kind of leading that subgroup um, that's getting underway uh, this fall over the next two years, and then Winter Flounder coming up. Um, yeah, so anyways, I hope you take away the framework and that I think it did a really good job with PLACE and we were able to produce a lot of uh, nice results that we could explore directly within the assessment. So again, this was a huge, huge team effort. And I, even though I'm presenting it, I did very little, a uh, small amount of the work compared to everything I showed today. So a big shout out to the entire working group here on the right and all the major contributors. Uh, again, the working papers are all publicly available on the Northeast Fishery Science Center's stock assessment portal. So you can Google that, or if you can, you can cop copy this link down here. Uh, I know my slides are available and the links in there as well. If you have any issues or particular questions, you can also feel free to shoot me an email, uh, which is listed right here.